the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, and welcome to our last About Women lecture in 1992. My name is Jennifer Junta, and I'll be introducing tonight's guest. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to first wish you all a very happy holiday season on behalf of the 92nd Street Y and tell you about some events this spring that may be of particular interest to this audience. On February 23rd, the president of the National Organization for Women, Patricia Ireland, <laughs> will be here as our annual Goldberg Lecturer. On March 30th, Letty Cotton Pogerbin will be moderating a panel on feminism and Jewish continuity with panelists Blue Greenberg, Rabbi Rachel Cowan, and Melanie K. Kantrowitz. Ms. Pogerbin is a founding editor of Ms. Magazine and author of Deborah Golda and Me, Being Jewish and Female in America. On April 20th, Betty Mahmoudi, the author of Not Without My Daughter, will talk about her escape from Iran with her daughter and the problems of international parental child abduction. And on May 9th, Marianne Williamson, author of the bestseller Return to Love, will be here discussing her new book entitled A Woman's Worth. And speaking of women of worth, <laughs> our guest tonight has been called feminism's most valuable player. Since 1990, Robin Morgan has been editor of the outstanding new No Advertising Ms. Magazine, which they've gener generously provided you all a copy of tonight, as well as being a founder and for over 20 years a leader of this wave of feminism in the U.S. She is also active in the international women's movement and founded the Sisterhood is Global Institute, the first international feminist think tank. She has traveled widely as an organizer, lecturer, and journalist across Europe to Central America, the Caribbean, Brazil, Japan, the Philippines, New Zealand, Australia, Indonesia, and Israel, and has twice gone into Palestinian refugee camps in the Middle East and the occupied territories of West Bank and Gaza to report on the conditions of women. Among her 15 books, which have been translated into nine languages, are the classic anthologies Sisterhood is Powerful and Sisterhood is Global, the novel Dry Your Smile, and The Merchild, The Demon Lover on the Sexuality of Terrorism, and Upstairs in the Garden, her new and selected poems, will be on sale following the lecture, along with her newest book, The Word of a Woman, Feminist Dispatches, 1968 to 1992 a collection of new and selected essays. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Endowment for the Arts Prize in Poetry, the Front Page Award for Distinguished Journalism, the Woman of the Year Award from the Feminist Majority Foundation. For almost 20 years at the forefront of the feminist movement, Robin Morgan has seen it and done it all, and is still going strong. And we're very fortunate to have her with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming her right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Robin Morgan. Can I have the house lights up a little more so I can see folks? Oh, that's nice. Now I can see you. Now it's all, not all just one way. Hi, I'm very, um, I'm very glad to be here tonight. Can you all hear OK? Okay, if I fade out at any point, you have to yell out and let me know because I have the infamous book tour cold. I would have hoped this made me sound sexy like Deborah Winger. It doesn't. It makes me sound like a dying frog. So I hope you'll, you'll bear with me. I am so glad to be home in New York. Um, I've been on the road for quite a few weeks now, um, and I can't tell you how in the middle of snowstorms in Chicago and rainstorms in San Francisco, I was thinking, oh, if I could just be among family in New York reading at the Y. So it's a real thrill for me to be here. Um, this is um, a defiantly eclectic uh, book, unlike all the rest of mine, which of course have been remarkably consistent. <laughs> um, about uh, a couple of years ago, you may remember that um, the media began declaring um, that we were in a post-feminist era. This, of course, made my teeth begin to grind uncontrollably 
because for 20 years, with staggeringly dull regularity, the media had been pronouncing us dead. I mean, in 1968, 1967, when we were first organizing, they said, it'll never get off the ground. And the minute, of course, that it did get off the ground, they instantly turned on a dime and said, well, it'll die now. And every year there's been, you know, a major New York Times article, Atlantic, Harper's, whatever, Washington Post saying, well, feminist movement's dead now. Oh, not yet? Well, surely now it's dead. So it's like the old joke, the um, um, predictions of our uh, demise have been greatly and prematurely exaggerated. Meanwhile, we kept on keeping on, and in fact, the movement grew. Um, of course, it is now vast and international and complex and diverse, and that's our greatest strength. Um, but during the period when the media was saying this was a post-feminist era, they were also saying um, younger women were not interested in feminism. Uh, this made me think that I must have a staggering capacity for hallucination, since I lecture quite a lot at universities and campuses, and um, uh, you know, it must be just it must be tactile as well as visual and auditory hallucination, because all I know is 500 people show up. Um, they're uh, they're mostly women. There's some young men of conscience. I'm sure some of the guys who are there are there because their girlfriends dragged them. You know, come on, Herman, you'll enjoy it. Um, but mostly, it's um, it's young women, and they're furious and and about all the right for all the right reasons, and they're fierce, and they're feminist. Um, well, of course, uh, that made me realize that we better be very careful who writes our history. The retrospectives had already be begun at that time, you see, as 20-year anniversaries were coming around, you know, so the media was doing its retrospectives, and, and, and a number of, I'm sure, quite well-meaning, but a little too trapped in their ivory towers, academics had been doing their retrospectives. They'd been going to secondary and tertiary sources, not to primary ones, and they were getting it wrong. So it seemed to me important that um, we try to set down some real truths uh, about what really did happen from the folks who were there, and also where we are now, and also where we're going, sort of the basic stuff, from the folks who brought you the women's movement. Um, so I decided to look back over um, more than 20 years of my short prose uh, and try to select um, pieces that would reflect not only the movement's growth and maturation, but mine as well, as a writer and as a feminist, because I seem to be the crazy person who first said the personal is political, uh, a phrase that became quite a catch phrase for feminism to my pride, and I still believe it. So there was no way to do such a book, you know, without in fact talking about the personal changes in one's own life, in one's own consciousness. Um, it's, it's a hubristic act to do, uh, put, to assemble any collection of one's work over 25 years, and particularly hubristic for a writer with a feminist consciousness, because you can't help knowing that two-thirds of all non-literates in the world are women. Um, and then you think, well, what am I doing, you know, writing books? On the other hand, um, <laughs> a man's word, everyone says, you know, is his honor. Um, and, and we live in a world where women have been both dishonored and silenced for a millennium. So in that context, so the word of a woman seems rather a fragile thing. And in that context, to break silence... Uh, and to keep re-breaking it again and again one's whole life long seems, if it is hubris, at least it's a humbling sort of hubris. So I began to put the pieces together. Well, what do you include and what don't you include? Oh, dear. Some pieces um, just, you know, sort of stood there flat foot in the middle of the floor and said, well, you can't not include me. Um, one such piece was the very first <clears throat> coverage of the Miss America pageant demonstration the first one, in 1968, <laughs> um, and I was the organizer of this demonstration. So I organized the demonstration, and then in the best tradition of participatory journalism, I covered this demonstration for the underground press. <laughs> and now I have collected it in a volume, and I have written a preface in which I critique it. <laughs> but it was important to include because truth, I mean, one, one basic, um, hilarious, sort of frivolous thing that the media got wrong, because, I mean, the media's got things wrong from frivolous to serious. But one, one frivolous example is bra-burning. Hello, world. We never burned bras. Hmm? We had 
give me a break. We had better taste, you know. We knew that burning rubber smells perfectly ghastly. We, we did uh, do guerrilla theater, and we had a large trash can that we had decorated with the words freedom. And into it, we threw ritualistically, you see. We threw, you know, various symbols of um, uh, women's oppression, uh, bras, um, those dreadful things called merry widows, which oh, some women remember. Uh, they were waist cinchers, sort of to give you a little scarlet O'Hara waist and you couldn't breathe. Um, and stiletto high heels and steno pads and diapers and dish rags, a whole lot of things. Well, the media, not surprisingly, with its memory fixation, uh, focused on bras. And this was not helped by the fact that a well-meaning writer, woman, journalist at the New York Post, thought she, she came and interviewed me as the organizer a week before the demonstration. She thought she was doing us a favor. She was very sympathetic. And she was afraid we would be dismissed and trivialized and they, that her editor wouldn't even run the story. So to dignify our cause, ugh, she made an analogy between these young militant women and the young men who were burning their draft cards in protest at the Vietnam War. Male headline writer at the New York Post picked that up from her lead and said something like, burning draft cards, dash, what now? Burning bras? Question mark. And that was it for the next 25 years, no matter where you went. Hey, hey, you, girl, you gals that burn bras. Um, so not only little things like that finally get clarified, but, but I, I like to think that more serious um, uh, errors that are about to be reified uh, and institutionalized um, in the history books, I hope will be set, if not straight, at least clear. Uh, for example, that um, from the beginning of this wave of feminism in this country, according to the media, it was a white middle class straight movement. This is simply inaccurate. From the very beginning, women of color, in particular African-American women and Latinas on this coast and on the East Coast, on the, on the West Coast, um, African-American women and Asian-American women and Native American women were involved among the founders of this wave, as were lesbian women among the founders of this wave, as were old women among the founders, as were working class women. But the media did not want to focus on them. In fact, I have literally been at press conferences where once the um, European-American women had said something, the minute that a woman of color opened her mouth, the cameras were shut up and they walked away. And we ran, you know, five streets down after them shouting, not fair. Yeah. So a whole range of um, truth-telling um, is, uh, is in the book. And I, I decided that I was not going to be revisionist even though in some of the older less, um, uh, essays, um, my voice, um, well, it's somewhere, it's an exercise somewhere between nostalgia and hilarity, my reaction to my own voice, I was pretty desperate for male approval. I was very feisty, but uh, since I come out of the left, um, the civil rights movement, the um, student movement, the anti-war movement, I still was trying so hard for male approval. Oh, just desperately to make the boys see that we were getting tear gassed and beat up and busted right along with them. And how come the minute we came home from the demonstration, we were supposed to make dinner and they were really tired because they'd been tear gassed and beaten and busted. And how come we were making coffee and not policy? And how come? Um, that anger finally brimmed over in a piece that, depending on your perspective, became famous or infamous, a piece called Goodbye to All That, which I wrote in 1970 which was my farewell, I divorce thee, um, to the male left, otherwise known as the boys' movement. Um, it came to have a life of its own. Um, it, it very much fell into what I would later learn to call the <gasps> you too phenomenon, where you write something thinking, I must be the only woman crazy enough to feel these things, and then these amazing, wonderful women from all over the country, and in fact, the world, write in and say, <gasps> You felt this too? I thought I was crazy. I've learned to trust it now. But at that point, I, I didn't know what I was as message in a bottle. And phrases from goodbye to all that, um, paragraphs, individual sentences, lines, um, word constructs got taken up by women uh, all over the country, put on buttons, on bumper stickers, on t-shirts, on greeting cards, on placards they carried in demonstrations. So that piece couldn't be excluded. The, the nice touching irony, just a little bit of feminist vengeance here, um, 
is that I named names in that piece uh, and the names of individual men and groups in the left and how they treated women and told the real stories. Now at that time these men were very heavy, heavy, and they were very famous and they were real honchos and everybody knew exactly you know, who I meant, with the possible exception maybe of three of them. People today would not recognize them. Abby Hoffman, who died tragically a suicide after uh, being underground and, and in prison for dealing cocaine. Um, they would remember, perhaps, Eldridge Cleaver, who became um, rather infamous for switching his politics, became a born-again Christian, affirmed the Pentagon, and was last seen, I swear I did not make this up, selling velvet cod pieces. Um, <laughs> would I make, you can't make these things up, you know? Um, and, um, and Tom Hayden, who of course became a California state senator, but is mostly known for having been married to Jane Fonda. With the exception of those three, everybody else in the piece has sort of dropped off the edge of the earth, even though they were as well known at the time. So, I had a footnote, these men and these groups, um, to make it intelligible to readers today. And I find it a matter of some um, irony that these intensely heavy men in the left uh, in the 60s and early 70s um, will basically go down in history because they were at one point fortunate enough to have been denounced by a feminist. Thus are life's little ironies. Uh, well, the book proceeds on up through the 70s. Um, uh, it's interesting to me how long if you look at it in terms of an individual lifespan, how long consciousness takes to really filter through. There's a piece in here, I think dated 1972, where I say the backlash is upon us. Um, there's a piece in here from the mid-1970s, I think it's the first piece that draws the connection between violent pornography and its influence on rape and violent acts against women. Uh, there's a piece in here dated 1979 on genital mutilation. And of course it's only now, in no small part due to Alice's wonderful book, Alice Walker's, that the subject of genital mutilation has finally made it into the public discourse. If you look at it from a historical perspective, however, the, um, the movement uh, has been amazing. I mean, whole phrases that are in common usage today, um, displaced homemaker, battered woman syndrome, lesbian custody fight, sexual harassment, didn't exist 20, 25 years ago. The, on the contrary, that was called just, you know, daily life. Hmm? It was called normality. Um, the, the 80s um, and the pieces written during the 80s bring, bring a change in tone and a complexification of the issues, um, both in the movement and in the writer. Um, and it's interesting to me because her, her earlier desperate for male approval, um, still being very feisty, but still hoping to persuade, the gravity shifts and she begins to be less concerned with that and more concerned with what her sisters think and feel, with their approval, their criticism, their validation. Um, and in fact, toward the end of the book, she actually is more as some would say, centered um, in her own voice. I think it not coincidental that the, as the issues get wider and more diverse, you know, we say that all issues are feminist issues because of course we're talking about the majority of the human species, not, not a minority. We're the majority of the population in this country and in fact the world. Not some little crazy fringe group here. Um, so in that sense, there's no issues that aren't women's issues. And as this writer <laughs> begins to understand that um, uh, and tries to be worthy of writing about it and from it and to it, um, the voice acquires a new self-confidence. Um, the rhetoric begins to drop away. That's always a good sign. All those words that end in T-I-O-N and I-S-M. Um, more of a personal tone comes through, more connections begin to be made, um, and more of a lyrical uh, and even a philosophical tone comes through and an integration with the, with the voice of the poet. Um, I did because I didn't intend to change every, any, any words in the essays, but leave them warts and all. I did decide to write a short preface for each essay, to place it in a historical context, and also so that I could be in dialogue, the me I am now with the me I was then. 
and um, and sometimes really criticize her, and sometimes say, "I can't believe you know that I was saying this," and uh, and other times, in effect, on the page to be able to go back and embrace her and say, "You weren't sure what you're doing. Um, in fact, you really didn't know uh, at all what you were doing. But not bad, kid. You're not bad at all." So what I will do tonight is um, is actually read from the last section of the book because it is not a book um, about the past. Uh, it is indeed my hope that younger feminists will find strong, sturdy shoulders in this book and truth on which they can stand and go even further. But we're not passing the torch yet. We're still fighting. Get your own torch. Um, and that other sisters who are long distance runners, like myself, um, will find recognition and tears and laughter and a reminder of how far we've come and how much further we have to go. And that men of conscience might perhaps glimpse the deeper reality, a totally different one really, in which most female human beings, I would hazard all in one way or another, live. Um, so that's the, that the, those are the prefaces to each piece. And this, this last piece, um, which is in fact the title essay of the entire book, is, um, is, of course, from the section of the 1990s. All of the pieces in the last section um, are brand new in the last couple of years. Uh, most have never appeared in print anywhere before. Um, and as I say, they are not surprisingly informed by international feminist consciousness. One is on the Montreal Massacre. One is on the women in the Philippines, based on a uh, journey of um, many weeks that I took there at the invitation of the Filipina women's movement. One is a follow-up piece to the crucial central chapter in The Demon Lover on Palestinian women in the refugee camps of the Middle East. I went back two years after writing that chapter because the Intifada had begun in the interim and I wanted to see how that impacted on women's lives, both Palestinian and Israeli. So the, there's a new essay on that here, um, pieces on the Gulf War. Um, and, um, and a very personal piece, which we excerpted uh, in Ms. a few issues ago, called The Politics of Silence. Um, this one, The Word of a Woman, uh, is um, even more, um, how shall I say, eclectic and, and um, uh, leaping around from, from little lateral leaps from one place to another than any other piece. So although we won't have time for me to read the whole of it, in a sense, because it's not written, you know, A, B, C, D, E, you won't miss yet what you haven't heard um, tonight. Um, and I will start by reading the, um, uh, the introduction. The Word of a Woman. In 1991, the world learned of a recently discovered ancient language devised at least 1,000 years earlier in a mountainous region of the Hunan province in central China. It was a totally female language. An Associated Press story by Kathy Wilhelm quoted a newspaper report from the China Daily that researchers had uncovered hundreds of stories, poems, songs, and letters written over the past millennium in a unique script invented by rural women for their own secret use. Nushi, women's writing, that's what Nushi means, used characters derived from standard Chinese to represent the syllables of the local dialect. Standard Chinese has no such phonetic base. It uses characters pictographically to represent meaning only. Chinese linguists believe that the women developed the script because they were forbidden to learn standard writing. Numerous as the remaining texts are, comparatively few survive because women valued them so highly that they willed the nushi to be placed in their coffins so that the cherished writings might be reread even after death. Such intimacy with and loyalty to the created word may seem bizarre to contemporary sensibilities, relentlessly assaulted as we are by commercial hype, political jargon, trendy buzzwords, and a general cheapening of expression. But it may seem less curious once one realizes that for hundreds of years, women used the script to record their hidden emotions and to communicate with one another surreptitiously. As one Nushi author wrote, 
Men leave home to brave life in the outside world. But we women are no less courageous. We can create a language they cannot understand. These were the words of a woman who might as well have written, we shall not suffer in silence. Because this female language was an underground code, an act of rebellion in conception, an utterance of rebellion in content. The writings gleam with rage at women's lot, at arranged marriages, brutal and vulgar husbands, the right of men to take numerous wives and divorce women whenever they chose, at enforced chastity for women, at required allegiance to one man even if widowed while young, at beatings survived and insults to human dignity endured, at being treated, as the women wrote, like slaves. But the tone was not always one of suppressed wrath. Some Nushi mourn the loss of a beloved woman friend to marriage. Thread-bound books of poems and songs would be given to a bride three days after her wedding. Tokens of grief that she could no longer spend time with her women friends. Commemorative artifacts of the relative freedom of her single life. And talismanic sources of strength to aid her survival as a wife. Apparently, the practice of Nushi declined once females were permitted access to education. When scholars began researching the script in the 1980s, they could locate only a dozen elderly women still able to read it. Only three could still write it. Yet the language had been preserved, alive, intact, and secret for a thousand years. It's something to remember the next time the um, media informs us, um, media which has such a high regard for the truth that they use it sparingly, um, <laughs> the next time they inform us that feminism is a Western or a recent uh, phenomenon. So it's in honor of these eloquent ancestors of all of us. Uh, the Nushi authors, that this following essay was written. And I have um, borrowed another Chinese tradition in the way it's set up on the page. Um, because it is assumed that author and reader are in dialogue with one another, the margins have been deliberately left much wider than usual for commentaries by the readers. The, these commentaries are not mere marginalia or jottings or appendages. On the contrary, um, they, I regard this essay as unfinished um, without them. So you, you can see, in other words, this is the book full measure on this side and, and the end of the preface here. And then it drops down into a column width for the rest of the essay with, with much light, wider um, margins. Um, fortunately, the typesetter at Norton um, cooperated. Uh, so here is this alternately funny and tragic and um, uh, bizarre, uh, my favorite essay. It's a letter to a reader in 2992, a thousand years hence. Dust whispers as you read this, whether from the page, the computer screen, or via some other communicative form beyond current comprehension. Intimate dust, brain cell past to brain cell future. These are messages from a human being hubristic enough to have faith in the power of words, even those of her own awkward making, mad enough to believe that mind must cease treating matter and matter stop treating mind as other. So I dare address you from what they call my time, which is not yet my time, eight years short of a new century and more dramatically of a new millennium. It requires an absurd leap of faith to believe that you are at all. If sentient life on this planet survives even the next hundred years, or if sentient life from elsewhere in the universe someday sifts curiously or indifferently through the ruins we leave of the ruins we are, what might be said of us? It might be said of us, they lived in a savage time. They fouled their own home. They ate flesh, warred on one another, 
kept slaves. They believed that the shape and the color of their shells was of importance. Their politics were even cruder than their technology. They feared their own intelligence and so ignored it. They failed to comprehend the obvious intelligence of their relatives, whether dolphin or cactus, eagle or redwood, monkey, lizard, spider, clay. Their greatest generosity was in sharing pain. They did not even understand their own energy, much less the field. It will be a subject of some debate from which of two flaws we suffered most or perished totally, delusion or denial. So here is a shred of evidence, a testimony, a minority report, a voice from this epoch in which I sometimes live imprisoned. These are what they call the realities of my age. It is the age of nuclear patriarchy. Our androcentric worldview has become a life-threatening disease. But it is also, one way or the other, the age of terminal patriarchy. For I am the Eve of Adam. And we'll skip around a bit here. If you who read these words still follow the ways of my epoch's logic, then you will misread so much of what I have to say to you as primitive. But if you exist, I must believe that you have evolved into trust. If you have not, then there will be so few, or so many, of you enduring such tormented or anesthetized lives that you will have neither the capacity nor the inclination to read this artifact. Indeed, you will have already erased me utterly for daring to be what I am, a memory of the future. So I must assume that you are not merely the last of my species, but the first of my kind. To you, then, I will confess several secrets I dared not utter aloud, except to one or two others in my own epoch. They're humble secrets of no great import, but they grow in me toward your birth. It is perplexing to find the language with which to speak to you, since I am no longer interested in words for which people have killed and died, and the richness of my epoch's language depends on such utterances that this eccentricity on my part eliminates such words as patriotism, wealth, fame, religion, category, revenge, custom, security, authority, zoo, stranger, normal, envy, tradition, conquest, nation, youth, age, tribe, enemy, destiny, race, triumph, alliance, territory, boredom, empire, ambition, ethnicity, ideology, manhood, and power, to name only a few. I count this as a loss of little consequence. That the word language itself, not as communication, but as impediment, belongs by all rights on that list. I count this as a threat of some proportions. What is serious, I admit, is the rapidly expanding inventory of all those concepts I do not understand. Although, of course, I understood them perfectly when I was younger. For example, I realize that I do not understand justice. I would once have said that my life was given over to the pursuit of justice. If so, I'm relieved that I got it back. Injustice, I understand. Well, may you say that this is because injustice has been part of my experiencing and my witnessing, but it's not so simple. Mercy, I understand, and even fairness, and I have experienced little of either. Regret, I comprehend, and remorse. Even writing an injustice, I understand, but justice, at best, it reeks of bargains, pettiness, hypocrisy. At worst, of retribution, vengeance, deals. It pretends that suffering can be weighed and computed, bought off, made whole. Why would the oath God give me the wisdom to temper justice with mercy be necessary? 
unless justice was inherently cruel. It stinks of punishment, of jealous and vengeful Judeo-Christian gods. It's a lazy settling for less than imaginative solutions, ones that might invoke words like transcendence, transformation, grace. The only justice I can catch a glimmer of is poetic justice, but that's really only a two-worded synonym for irony. And so far, at least, I still understand and retain quite an affection for irony. No longer understanding justice puts me out of step with some of the best minds of my era, although there is some comfort in knowing that it also puts me out of step with some of the worst ones. You see? You see how stupid I am becoming? Furthermore, time is also quite beyond me now. I once thought I understood time in a basic sort of way. Clocks, calendars, all those imposed and imposing measurements that we devise to pace off eternity. When I learned that others, far more precociously stupid than I, had realized that time and space were identical and indissoluble, I became quite excited. But of late, I cannot grasp time at all. How space itself, you see, now flies. But especially I can't grasp it in terms of the singular. That is, I cannot see time for all of its variant times. There is, for example, flying south time to the Canada geese. There is berry time to the juniper bush. There is hyacinth time to the bulb. There is nova time to the aging giant red star and dividing time to the blastula. These do lend considerable perspective to such arbitrary notions as meet you at 315 Sharp at the corner of 5th and 42nd Street. Useful though such a phrase might be, still, geese and juniper, hyacinth, sun star, and cell are never late nor early. Being gradually divested of vocabulary is only part of my problem in addressing you. Yet, of course, were I still encumbered with understanding such words as justice or time, I doubt I would be trying to address you at all. This is why I will have presumed upon your patience with what in my day would have been called disjointed thoughts. Since it is now believed that the brain is less like a computer than like a self-regulating organ, and since every thought was once a chemical, which means that mind becoming matter is a chemical process, as is matter becoming mind. Well, isn't it difficult to imagine how any fresh thoughts could originate as other than disjointed? Most of my contemporaries would tell me not to mind. But you, of all people, know what a strange appetite the brain has when you let it free to graze. And how do we speak to one another? in a language not our own. To create our language, we would need to go beyond the pictographs of mere descriptive meaning. We would need to enter into the local dialect, as it were, toward the phonetics of reality, toward how reality sounds and feels. We would need to speak in metaphor. Not simile, mind you. No, not, not that well-meaning but cowardly like and as if, that sort of middle-of-the-road, wishy-washy approximation that feels compelled to over-explain itself. No, metaphor, the essence of the thing itself, sufficiently tiny, unique, and specific to attempt an implosion into the universal. For example, if I speak to you from ashes, do I by now already know if fire is the act of burning? Or is fire what it produces? Sparks, flame, heat, light, carbon, embers. Is fire not more than the sum of its entropy? Or, for example, a very short story. As the years went by, she found it extremely difficult to get the caviar stains out of the pillowcase. The champagne drops had disappeared, but of course the blood stains had only faded. Or, for example, geophagia 
is the name for an uncontrollable desire to eat Earth. Perfectly healthy, well-adjusted citizens in certain communities around the world enjoy eating dirt or clay. Some become connoisseurs partial to different kinds of soil. Many prefer to crumble it onto a cookie sheet and bake it for a few minutes so as to intensify the pleasure of the crunch. Less than a craving, but more than a preference. This is neither a religious nor cultural practice, nor a superstitious fetish. Earth eaters are found in considerable numbers in the U.S. agrarian south, where the phenomenon constitutes a unique bond between those blacks and whites who practice it. When circumstances force these rural people into urban surroundings, they sometimes must content themselves with store-bought starch or chalk. Only recently have scientists realized that the particular earth or clay chosen for eating is rich in dietary nutriments and may in fact contain natural medicinal value for a range of ailments from indigestion through ulcers to colon cancer. All known earth eaters are women. Or, for example, who invented the question mark? Encyclopedias are mute on the subject. But the mystery haunts me. Suzanne K. Langer, another contemporary Nushi writer disguised as a philosopher, wrote, the notion of giving something a name is the vastest generative idea that ever was conceived. But surely the notion of giving such an intangible emotion as curiosity, a permanent symbol, runs a pretty close second. I think it not illogical, even in my millennium's rather cramped sense of logic, to hypothesize that a woman invented the question mark. And for that matter, probably the question. Such innovations do spring from need. If, for instance, you are forbidden to learn to read and write, you create a means of language. If you are forbidden knowledge, you devise the question. If you are forbidden both literacy and knowledge, don't you invent the question mark? Dearest friend of my imagination's optimism, across a hundred centuries I grope toward you. From years of seeing both too little and too much, out of a yearning to dance alone, in public or not, neither for exhibition nor in mourning, out of a longing to think in common with my kind. Because you will have grown beyond justice, you will not need to judge us. You may even smile, feeling something between recognition and respect in compassion. But please know as well that we were capable of defiance, even of joy. Know that when they vowed we would never forget their martyred battle heroes, we bent our energies on the heresy of forgetting. Know that we were no longer able or content to encounter or render surfaces. No matter how tempting their density, nor how seductive their luminosity, but were drawn instead to what lives beneath the facade, to geometries of the bone, to refrains of the blood. Know that we sometimes even dared the grace of laughing at ourselves. There were more than a few of us, trying to find one another, often in rage and bereavement, sometimes in desire and delight. It was not simple or easy, but it was not as difficult as we pretended and feared. And the miracle that will be was that we who believed this might be buried with us, because we valued it so, because they could not understand it, because it was secret, because it could be reread only after our death. All these thousand years later is in your hands, one of the twelve who can still decipher it. Find the other eleven and begin again in blastula time. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, we, um, if I can have more light on, on the house, that's even better. Then I could see people even better. Um, we we're going to throw the floor open for questions, discussion, answers, announcements. Feminist, feminist um, tradition. I mean, anyone has any particular announcements, demonstrations, sit-ins, seizures, occupations, picket lines, meetings. They, by all means, um, please feel free to share them with us. Um, but certainly also any questions if you have them. It still is a little hard for me to see out there. You're going to go silent on me. Why? I want you to know in Minneapolis, in Chicago, in San Francisco, they have, well, of course you don't have questions. You're New Yorkers. Why are we doing a question period? We're in New York. We have all the answers. We have all the answers. This is Marilyn Fitterman, who is president of New York State. Now, you don't have an announcement, Marilyn? Yes, I'm not president as of last week. You're not president as of last week? That's absolutely shocking. I don't know what New York State now will do. But, I mean, surely there's some sort of announcement of a demonstration or troublemaking? Good. This is another young feminist I'm hallucinating. Okay. <laughs> so I'm really sitting here. I'm hallucinating. We're all, yes, indeed. What is very nice is, of course, that, that the media now, I mean, since the amazing year, which saw both, um, well, a number of things, didn't it? I mean, first it saw the Webster decision and, and uh, half a million people, um, at least half of them, um, in their 20s, pouring into the streets of Washington. And then there was wonderful Anita Hill. Um, there was also courageous Patricia Bowman in the William Kennedy Smith trial. There was also courageous Desiree Washington in the Mike Tyson trial. And the media, you will notice, has stopped saying um, it's a post-feminist era. Of course, they went directly from that into saying it's the year of the woman, <laughs> which some of us find a rather offensive phrase. You know, the UN gave us a decade, at least. <laughs> and as far, as far as we're concerned, it's the era. It's the epoch. It's the age of the woman, um, but nonetheless, at least they don't say that you don't exist anymore. And I think it's just wonderful that you will be taking over. Yes? Well, how do you think that the, uh, the Clinton administration's impact on the feminist, because he is so pro-feminist, do you think that that may officiate me somewhat? Well, I would say that what is more interesting to me is the feminist movement's impact on Clinton than his in, in, impact on the feminist movement. I, I have to tell you, I am not one of those feminists who you know, was ecstatic about Clinton Gore. I did say in a Ms. editorial before the elections that I was not ecstatic um, and that I didn't think he was God's gift to the women's movement. But on the other hand, I was so desperate to get George Bush out that I would have voted for a gerbil. And in fact, some women in the Midwest sent me buttons about, about a, two weeks after the editorial came out that said gerbil for president. <laughs> um, and in fact, I may have voted for a gerbil. I mean, I don't know. Um, we'll see. I think that what we'll have to do is, is, um, uh, is not lay back at this point. But now is when the real work begins. I mean, we really have to hold this administration's feet to the fire to make them keep their promises because they will backpedal uh, the minute we don't, there will be, of course, tremendous pressure from, from the right for them to do so um, and from folks who know how to play the game. If we relax for one minute, um, we will just be betrayed by yet a new group of pale males, which is, after all, mostly what they are. Certainly Clinton and Gore, two more pale males. And I worry, in all honesty, I really, I really worry about, you know, there's like a particular disease that the oppressed suffer from. It's like an occupational hazard. It's not only women, but it's uh, men of color. Um, and it's, it's lesbian and gays and, and uh, people who are disabled and old people. It's like terminal gratitude. And it's really very dangerous. We're so used to getting nothing that, you know, three crumbs come our way and we say, oh my God, my God, we are so great. So you, what you have is women and some men of conscience all across the country saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, look at that, what we've won in the Senate. Six out of 100. Could we have a little perspective here? Um, we have doubled our number in the House. This is wonderful. We're into the 40s. Out of plus 400 representatives, we have one-fifth of state legislatures. One-fifth. We are the majority of the population. So 
all I want to do is not is not throw cold water on it. I mean, I am delighted. I, this is a record number of women who are uh, in electoral power. And that, to me, is the real triumph, even more than Clinton Gore. Um, what we have to do, I think, now is, is two things in terms of those women, and that's where I place my real interest, is, 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 the, is the, the, the women who, who we've elected. One is we've got to support them. We can't abandon them. In there, they are going to suffer intense, soul-eroding pressure. And the other is we've got to remind them who put them in there. And in fact, remind Clinton and Gore, this is like the feminist version of Guys and Dolls, stick with me, baby, I'm the voter you came in with. Yeah? Um, and take credit for putting in this administration. That's another thing that just makes me furious. Whenever we win something, somehow it's immediately taken and mainstreamed, and it has nothing to do with the feminist movement anymore. If it's good, it can't be feminist. If it's feminist, it can't be good. So that now, for example, the network of battered women's refuges around this country, I have literally, uh, when I talked about that as a, as a special pride accomplishment in a long list of things that the women's movement in the US has accomplished over 20 years, I have literally had a journalist say to me, oh, but the battered, battered women's movement, that has nothing to do with feminism. That's about family issues. Um, you know, when in, when in the 60s we were talking about battered women and the media was saying they stay because they like to stay, you know. So I think we've got to claim this victory. It was gender gap that put him in. Um, and I think we've got to say um, we put you in and we now hold you accountable, not only to the women that, that we put in, but in fact especially to the administration. I do think that at least on his promissory note, there seem to be very good positions, um, but they're not all good. I mean, I think we have to watch him very carefully on welfare because it's a very reactionary position, in fact, that he has. I find it a source of glee and relief um, that, uh, that he has nominated Donna Shalala um, as um, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services because she is um, a real one. I mean, uh, some of the other women that he has nominated, not so sure. I mean, some of them might be of the sort who, when you say there's a woman in the room, they say, where, where? You know, um, but Donna Shalala has a real commitment to women um, and, and sees women as a real constituency and is in touch with real needs, not abstractions. That's a very encouraging. And we'll see what the rest of the appointments are. So far, proportionately, it still is overbalanced in terms of more pale males, you know. Um, and I do not think that the presence of Hillary Rodham uh, it solves all our problems. I mean, many folks just sort of say, well, there it is. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, she is a very smart, um, uh, you know, and shrewd woman. I and many other feminists um, had a little bit of trouble with the, um, to be nice, you could say pragmatic, to be honest, you could say cynical. Um, transformation of her during the campaign into a house dress wearing cookie baker. I happen to think that house dresses at times can be wonderfully comfy and schlumpy, and I bake a mean chocolate chip cookie. But Hillary Rodham, <laughs> this is not Hillary Rodham. Yeah? Um, and it will be interesting to see how she tries to cope with you know, um, the mode that is set up for her. Clearly, she will be a, a force behind the scenes. But basically, I don't think it's that relevant. I keep saying to folks who say, but Hillary, but Hillary, I keep saying that our, our obsession with first ladies and spouses of will decline in direct proportion to the number of women that we elect into the offices themselves. Just that simple, you know. So basically, yes, it's good news. Um, no, I don't think we can afford to relax. Now is when I think we really have to make it very clear to this administration that we're serious, that we have a huge agenda, that it impacts on everything, that maybe the bottom lines are reproductive freedom and freedom of sexual choice because those have to do with our own most basic colonized bodies, but that the environment is a feminist issue, that the debt in Latin America is a feminist issue, that this international sexual slave trade in Asia is a feminist issue, that nuclear testing in the Pacific where the women have give birth to jellyfish babies because of it is a feminist issue, um, that the high percentage of women dying from HIV AIDS in Africa is a feminist issue, um, that the fact that 90% um, of all refugee populations around the world are women and children is a feminist issue, and the feminization of poverty at home is a feminist issue. Um, you cannot marginalize either the issues or the constituency. 
of female human beings anymore, and I don't think they've quite taken this on board, so we have to do a little bit more educating. Yeah. Did everybody hear the question, or shall I? It looks like you did, yeah. Um, I've changed in my own uh, attitudes on terms of violence and nonviolence. Um, anyone who's read The Demon Lover knows that I was involved in various underground cells in the US during the 1960s. I fortunately escaped with my life and my sanity intact before um, I, I um, how shall I say, fell so low as the weather underground. I never got quite that far, but I got pretty near. Um, and so I do understand it, and I don't say this lightly. I mean, it comes from a certain place of despair when you feel nothing else is being heard. Um, even though I myself, for myself, renounce that particular tactic or strategy, uh, unless it is very, very clearly in immediate self-defense, I do not mean to include the right of a battered wife to save her life. I mean, obviously, I, obviously I support that. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I have for myself as a planned political strategy, I have renounced those tactics. Even upon renouncing them, I m made it a point of principle to reserve judgment about other women's decision to use that. Particularly, it ill behooves a European American in a superpower nation to make judgments about, say, women in national liberation struggles in, in the South in the Southern Hemisphere in the third world, so-called third world. Um, but it's very interesting. Uh, the more that I have traveled in the Southern Hemisphere, the more that I have met not the men who represent those women at international conferences and say, well, our women are real guerrilla fighters and our women, da, 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 and our women put the revolution first and put feminism, say, the more you actually talk to the women, you find something very interesting, which is that they're feminists. Um, which is that they are appalled by violence, that they find it gratuitous, that they um, are tired of being the ones who mourn, who grieve, who pick up the pieces, who wash the bodies, um, you know, uh, and who are supposed to somehow be creating more cannon fodder out of their own bodies. Um, the women who brought this home, I think, most dramatically to me were the women in the Palestinian refugee camps, where, of course, the, the world stereotype of the Palestinian woman is, you know, gung-ho on the tanks with the, you know, hand grenades and, you know. Um, and that simply, tr frankly, is not what I found on either trip. And in fact, the essay that is in this book, um, the post-Intifada essay, I found them even more appalled by the violence and e with an even more clearer analysis or take on it, which is that it's, it's the men really get off on this. What is with the men that they get off on this? You know, it's their ver they, they 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 say their own version in Arabic of what our our joke is that some men seem to suffer from terminal testosterone poisoning. You know, um, I found that um, with women in the Philippines who had left the NPA, um, the um, uh, the underground army. I found it with women in the favelas. I found it with women living under the most unspeakable conditions of poverty. Um, women who couldn't read or write, but were very smart. Um, and that has changed me even more now. So while I'm not in any way, shape, or form, and never would be a spokesperson for those women, one of my jobs as a Western, Northern Hemisphere, European American, whatever, woman with access um, to the printed word is to be a vehicle for those voices who don't get heard because, in fact, the leaders of their revolutions control their own media and control their access to the world. So the hand-picked women who do go to conferences, you know, um, are the wives of or the daughters of or the, of the male honcho leaders, and they are the ones who are saying, kill, die for the revolution. But not the women in the camps, not the women in the favelas, not the women in the rice paddies in the Philippines. They want to live. They want their children to live. In terms of your more immediate question about um, uh, it was about women in the military or specifically lesbian and gay in the military? Yeah. I mean, I, as, a, as a feminist, I take a position that wherever there is an institution that is barring people, people have a right to be there. 
<laughs> it just, you know, it isn't necessarily my thing. I mean, I have to tell you, from 1968, read right straight through to today, the end-all, be-all of my feminist ideal was not, hey, well, let's get into the military. Yeah, yeah. Um, it really was not top, uh, right up there on the top of my list. But then again, I mean, you know, when Janet Guthrie raced in the Indianapolis 500, I thought, oh, my God, what kind of person wants to drive very, very fast in a small car? <laughs> this is not my thing, you know. Um, right now, um, Anne Bancroft is leading this amazing team of women. They're trekking all the way um, without even dogs to the, to the South Pole because they don't want to, you know, um, uh, leave any garbage or any trash or any dog duty or anything. They want to really leave them, you know, and I think, my God, not only do you trek all the way to the South Pole, but you want to do it neatly. <laughs> only women would do this. We don't want to leave any trash behind. I, you know, I wouldn't... I mean, so there's lots of stuff that I, I, it's not my thing, but if there are women who want to be in there, um, then I will support them. I would like to see a day, sure, when there isn't a military anywhere in the world, or, or if there is, that it would be a green army. I mean, we, you know, that it would be doing the kinds of things like cleaning up after hurricanes and saving rainforests and, you know, in, in, in disasters, going in and building houses. And I'm not unaware that most of the men and women um, uh, whether lesbian or, or heterosexual uh, or, you know, or gay men or uh, black or white, and it's mostly, of course, a, um, men of color and now women of color, army, volunteer army, join the army for very specific reasons. I mean, there's no other place in the society where um, you can get free medical care, free dental care, free education, a chance to travel, a chance to learn a skill, you know. Um, so unless and until this country offers other options to folks who come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, it is not surprising, as everyone runs around and says, my goodness, but you know, this army is mostly African Americans. Well, big shock. Why? It's not big patriotism, you know? Um, and as long as lesbian women um, and gay men want to be uh, full citizens in, and, in, and in their... Um, the definition of that is their right to, quote, serve their country in the armed forces. Of course I back that right, absolutely. It's hardly as though, I mean, you know, we haven't all been in there to begin with. It's just what the, what the generals get upset about is that you're supposed to be in there and, you know, not flaunt it. Heterosexuals flaunt it all the time. But, you know, I mean, you're supposed to, uh, you, you can, in other words, you can be in the army, you're just supposed to lie about it, your sexuality. Um, so that seems a bit hypocritical to me, you know. Yeah. Let me see if there's anybody over here. No, this side is being okay. I want to speak about a situation I've been noticing um, in my travels and experiences with the military. Um, and I know that Right.
There is. You're wonderful. <laughs> You're just wonderful. <laughs> Um, yeah, see, she's got her own torch. You don't need to pass a torch. <laughs> she's got a torch. And this is going to take quite a few torches, burning, getting this one changed. Um, yeah, I mean, the good, you're, you're absolutely right. And you're, of course, you're also speaking of a generation that came to adulthood during the, you know, the Middle Ages, otherwise known as the Reagan-Bush years, <laughs> when the word was out on the campuses that you don't make waves, you get good grades, you just get out of campus, and then you get a job, and then you don't make waves there. Um, and uh, and they, they, have, they believed somehow that if they were nice girls, just be nice and don't make waves, that all would be well. And so they have come a cropper with this shocking fact that even if they do everything right, you know, they'll still be blamed and they'll still be ignored and they'll still, even if they make it up, 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 they will still crash concussion at the glass ceiling. And of course, you know, women of that age are not even making it near the glass ceiling. We're down with a bronze, you know. Um, the good news um, is that there is a lot more female mentoring going on now. Nowhere near enough, you're absolutely right, but a lot more than there used to be. Um, I don't mean to sound like a gray eminence here, um, but I remember the day. <laughs> I never thought I'd say this kind of thing. But I do remember the day when, I mean, there would be a sole woman in a corporation, you know, and she would be glad to be the token because she had bought into the line that she was the exception to her sex. And that, in fact, began to change even in the 70s and even throughout the 80s, um, very quietly, new girls' networks, as they have come to be shorthanded, um, began growing. Uh, where women have brought along and, and promoted and nurtured and done classes for and, um, you know, protégéed and mentored and taken under their wing lots more women with the realization that this won't really change until a critical mass of women, you know, are involved anywhere, where the, whether it is in um, the blue-collar ghetto, the pink-collar ghetto, the corporate ghetto, uh, the media, um, certainly the political realm. I mean, it's amazing, you know, that, do you realize, have any, you heard that in the Senate, the major thing that is worrying the Senate is that they now have to put in a woman's bathroom. This is serious politics. Bec and, and what have Barbara Mikulski and Nancy Castlebaum been, been doing? They have been schlepping down the corridor to use the public washrooms. This is, you know, I mean, on, one, on the one hand, it's hilarious. On the other hand, it's appalling. So it only changes at, the, you know, at the crisis washroom politics level, um, or at all the levels you're talking about, when, when there really is a critical mass involved. And the critical mass gets involved um, and gets its sea legs, you know, and figures out how to, how to survive with the help of other women. And it's, it's true in any area, you know? I mean, it's true whether you're in the wor in formal workforce or you work at home as a, as a housewife. You, if you try to grapple with this issue by yourself, you will go quite bananas. You know, um, because it's all stacked against you. But, but once you connect with other women, um, you 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 find yourself doing the single most profoundly radical act imaginable in the patriarchy, which is that you compare notes. This is why it has been trivialized as gossip for years, um, because in fact, when women actually then there's the U2 effect when women compare notes and realize, oh my God, I'm not the only one who felt that way. You mean, you mean the boss did, said that to you? You mean he chased you around that? And I thought I'd done something to provoke it. You mean you're only getting such and such, and they told me that, in fact, you were getting paid three times that much because you'd done such and such job, and I'd refused to do that job because... That's where it happens. Um, and once that communication is ongoing, there's nothing that can stop it. So yes, I think it's a real... It's, an, it's a vital cross-generational appeal that you've just made. Um, and I think that older women have got to be there for you, or women of any age, in other words, women who are in a relative position of uh, empowerment or access. Well, one, 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 no, and that hurts, of course, that's extraordinarily painful. But one place to start, if, if, if the mentor is not available, is with yourselves. 
among yourselves. I mean, there, nowhere is it writ that you need somebody of any previous generation or whatever, you know, um, uh, to invent the wheel for you. You just, you know, make a wheel, you stand back, you say, what do you know, it rolls. Hmm. If there are no more questions, I think that we better get to the signing, but perhaps we can talk one-on-one -on -one outside. I'm very grateful to you for coming. Oh, one more quick question. Sorry. Okay, and and I'm going to wind it up. I I wish you power, and I wish you the grace to use it well. Thank you for coming. <laughs>